If you don't have one, grab a Bible from underneath the chairs. There's also some on the Welcome Center. The Welcome Center Bibles are giveaway Bibles. If you don't own a Bible, keep it, take it, bring it home with you, and it's our blessing to you. Uh, version, iPhone, iPad, if you've got a phone, Android, whatever, version is the app I recommend. We're going to be in John chapter 9. No, no, John chapter 6 today. I'm getting way ahead of myself, weeks, weeks ahead. John chapter 6 again today. That's where we started last week, and we're going to finish up John chapter 6 today. And we're going to try to cover a fair bit of ground today. We're going to start in verse 22 and work our way on into verse 71. So you can imagine uh, we got some places to go and things to cover here. And uh, several weeks ago, we started talking about this, talking about Jesus' authority as the Gospel of John lays it out before us. And, and, and his authority is different than the authority of this world simply because. Jesus is God, right? Uh, he has always been, and therefore his, his authority comes not simply as just one teacher among many, but his authority comes because he is God in flesh, that he is the creator God. Therefore, a level and a degree and a, a type of authority that none other could possibly ever possess. And so, as God and Jesus gives us, you know, those, those thou shalt and thou shalt not kinds of things, they're more of an invitation into actual life than they are here, just kind of try this on for size and see how it might work for you, right? And, and we said that when it came to Jesus' authority, uh, a lot of people will be game for Jesus' authority as long as Jesus does for them with that authority what they want him to do. You know, see, people, people are, are cool with Jesus. If, if Jesus is doing, you know, that, that healing the sick, um, you know, giving them good things, right? Making everything go the way they want it to go. But then they kind of buck up against his authority when Jesus' authority begins to confront their strongly held beliefs and their personal wants and desires. And, and I had mentioned previously that we're going to see this moment where where people who seem to be all about Jesus get confronted with his authority, and then they show their true cards. Basically, they're trying to use him as their personal errand boy to get what they want from him. And, and, and effectively, they're kind of like, I, I don't really see him as God. I don't really want to follow him. I certainly don't want to worship him. And, and that's what's going to be exposed. As I, I mentioned, this, that was going to be coming here. And today is the fun day where we get to kind of see some of that. So I'm glad that you're here to be part of it. So let's dive in. John chapter 6. And we're going to pick it up with verse 22. Um, if you weren't here last week, um, the last thing we looked at in the Gospel of John was Jesus feeding the 5,000. And if you know the story, you know the 5,000 was just the 5,000 men. So in actuality, he probably fed about 12,000 people from five barley loaves and two old fish. I don't know if they were walleye or what they were, but they were two fish, right? And so, uh, and then after that, he, he walks on water, of course. And those were the two signs, the two wonders, the two miracles that we really focused on. And, and this sermon kind of piggybacks off of that. And, and we're going to dive into that today. And you'll see, uh, as we dig into this, you'll understand, originally, as I planned the sermon series, this was supposed to happen last week, not this week, because this sermon has some orientation towards communion. And that's because I planned like six months in advance. And when I planned, I didn't have in the schedule the Minnesota Teen Challenge. And so that kind of pushed everything back a week, which is totally fine. You'll just have to connect the communion we took last week a little bit to what we talk about today. And so that's where we're going to be at. John 6, 22 is where we're going to kick off. I'm going to read it. You'll see it on the screen, and you're welcome to follow along here. It says, On the next day, the crowds that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So now we kind of see here uh, some motivation on why it is that they're following Jesus. He put some bread in their belly, right? That's uh, very self-centered. That's why they've been following him. 
And so then he continues on. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers, they ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Well, then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say now, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, pausing for a second, if you're not a Christian, it just kind of got a little weird, right? Let's keep reading. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For it says that Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe him and who it was that would betray him. As he said, This is why I told you no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? 
And yet, one of you is the devil, or a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now, as you could hear, there's a lot of stuff there, right? I mean, we could spend like four weeks on this passage. We're not going to, and I'm not going to make a long sermon out of this. This isn't a hostage situation, I promise you. We've got soup that we've got to eat. But, but there's a lot of meat here, right? But I, I want to highlight some things out of it that I think are really significant for our understanding in regard to whether or not we are trying to fill our souls with those things that, that cannot actually fill our souls or whether we're actually moving on to feast on the thing that can actually nourish our soul. If you're following along in verse 27 through 29, there's a, a really significant moment. And if you're, if you're kind of like that, that type A personality, right? That type A personality likes to, to stress and likes to worry about things. You're like, this is kind of for you here. If you're that type A that needs that structure, right? You're like, like, like just give me, give me the nine steps I need to follow to glory, right? And, 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 and then if you look at it, it says, then they said to him. And so they're in this conversation about ultimate reality, about life and about meaning. And they ask him, what do we have to do? What, what do we need to do to be doing the works of God? Now, now tell me this isn't just like a, a superhuman impulse, right? Like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just tell me what to do, Jesus, right? Okay, great. Jesus is God. All right, fine, whatever. And, 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 and what do I need to do, though, right? He's our Lord and Savior, right? Oh, yeah, whatever. Great. But what do I need to do? Give me the nine things. Give me, give me a list. Nine things I need to do. Ten things I, I shouldn't do. Give me that list, right? And we kind of feel safe in that space when we have that list. When we, a lot of those type A personalities, like, like if I can go down that list and check those things off, then I know I got this faith thing covered, right? Just tell me what to do that I can live in this blessed life. And then tell me what not to do too. Just, just give me the details. Give me the scales so I can, you know, tilt them in my favor. And then look at Jesus' answer in verse 29. Jesus answers them. And it's a super simple answer. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Ta-da! Right? If you were looking for nine easy steps and five things not to do, He's just kind of crushed that. That's it. He doesn't say, radically believe this, marvelously believe that. You want to do the work of God? Here it is. Believe in the one he sent. That's the gospel. Well, what about feeding the poor, right? What, what about evangelism? What about living a holy life? Well, where do you think all of those things spring from? Do they come from your effort or the abiding presence of Jesus? Because, you see, those things, loving, serving, giving, all those things don't come from the wellspring of our effort. The things that come from our efforts, guilt, shame, failure. And we can try to modify our behavior to the best of our abilities, but that still only leads to death. Jesus has already said, I'm giving you life in spirit. That our, our flesh is effectively worthless. You want to know what the works of God are? Believe in the one he sent, he says. He's teaching us here very clearly that, that our faith is not abstract. It's not an existential trust in some unknown thing. What Jesus is teaching here is that our faith has a, a coherent object at its center. We're, we're not just simply a people of, of blind, dumb faith. We are a people who put a faith in Jesus. Our faith has an object. It's not abstract, it's Jesus. What it means to do the work of God is to cultivate belief, to cultivate love, to cultivate zeal for Jesus. That's what it means. Everything else flows out from that. The works of God are a growing love for Jesus and a growing understanding of who He is and in all of His magnificence. If you define the works of God simply in terms of all the thou shalt and thou shalt not kind of things without the power of the Spirit, 
you'll habitually fail. You'll be habitually shamed and disappointed. Or if you're good at being good, the other result is instead of failure, maybe you're good at being good, so then you become some arrogant kind of self-sufficient, self-righteous jerk. Right? And I just wanted to to lay that as a, a foundation of where we're going. What are the works of God? To cultivate a trust and faith in Jesus. It looks like surrender. That's all it looks like. Our independent will colliding with the reign of Jesus saying, all right, your way is better than my way. Even though I would like to do it differently maybe in this situation, I'm trusting you. That can be difficult, but that is what it is. That's a part of what it looks like to do the work of God. Then in verses 35 through 50, Jesus says he is the bread of life, right? I am the bread of life. Now there are, are seven of these I am statements in the Gospel of John. And each and every time that Jesus makes one of these I am statements, it enrages the people who are listening to him. Now to us, that doesn't seem like it should make a lot of sense, right? But they're hearing something that it's very important that we understand when Jesus says this. Every time Jesus says, I am, then, you know, fill in the blank, I am the bread of life, or whatever it might be. Whenever he says that, I am this, he's using the same two words that are used back in the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 3, when God gives his own personal name. When God introduces himself to his people, he says, I am who I am. That's translated as Jehovah Yahweh, the Lord, right? It's his personal name. You can't say that you are I am in this time, in this culture, in this place, and not have nearly everybody who hears your voice believe that you are committing blasphemy. Only, only, God, only God can say that about God's self. That's the personal name of God to the people of God. And it was so holy on their lips that they literally would not spell it out if they had to write that name down. They wouldn't spell it out. They'd leave all the vowels out. That's how we get Yahweh, right? If you've ever seen that in written print. So they'd leave out all the vowels. Almost never would they even say the name Yahweh. And Jesus is like, yeah, I'm him. Right? And now he's adding on these little pieces along with it. He says, not only I am, but I am the bread of life. He's saying in that argument about manna from heaven. Again, we, we've kind of covered this previously, but the Jewish identity is, is wrapped up in the Exodus, right? That's where they were called out from. That's where they were formed. That's where God led them into the land that he had promised them. All of that and a whole lot more. And so this Jewish identity is so rooted in the Exodus, in this Passover, uh, in this wilderness journey that they had into this promised land, that they had no idea of, of how to define themselves outside of that. So this is why, if you study the Bible, when, when the Israelites become a conquered people, this is why things get so dark. They had no idea how to identify themselves when they were dispossessed of the land that God had given them. God had promised it to them. Now it was gone. Now who are we? We're a people without a land. They had no idea how to define themselves outside of this exodus and this idea of, that comes from the Passover. And as we, we saw last week, Jesus has just fed them, right? And then he's claiming again to be God. And they're like, well... What sign will you do for us then? What miracle will you perform for us? Moses, Moses, you remember Moses? Yeah, we all remember Moses. Moses, he gave us bread to eat in the wilderness, right? Jesus is really, really quick to remind them. Actually, no, he didn't. Moses, he didn't do anything. Appreciate the sentiment, but Moses was a stuttering fool who failed in his attempt to get you out of oppression. God gave you bread to eat, not Moses, right? In fact, 
Not only did he give you bread to eat then, he's giving you bread even now. In fact, I am, I am the bread of life. The bread that satisfies just for a little while was the manna. But Jesus can satisfy eternally. But sadly, we pursue after other things anyhow. You see, we constantly seek after other things to fill that, that the God-shaped hole in our souls. We all know people who've train-wrecked their lives chasing after things that weren't God. Sometimes they're even good things, right? But they're not God things. And when you put anything in God's place, that's idolatry, and that will fail you. We all need the bread of life. And as we're reading the story from here, things kind of get strange, as I mentioned before. From here, the conversation shifts from what satisfies us to flesh and blood, right? Now, you and I are in this really privileged position in history where we look back on the resurrection and and we understand the institution of the Lord's Supper of communion and we understand all of that and and we get that and we can make sense out of that. But that's not where these people were in that moment. They're hearing about bread being tied to manna and then all of a sudden he's like, you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, right? And if you're in the crowd that day, you, you, you don't have a framework to understand that. You don't, you don't have the, the background that we have with the understanding of what communion is to make sense out of, eat me, here, right? I'm the bread of life, time for lunch. They didn't have that context. So it's no wonder when he says this that they freak out a little bit, right? And what Jesus is pointing to in this moment is not just to the Lord's table and communion, but to the great theological truth underneath that table. The idea of union with Christ. When the Bible talks about a a personal and dynamic relationship between a believer and Jesus, it frequently uses this term, the, the union with Christ, by being in Christ, right? In fact, the New Testament is jammed full of this little two-word phrase, this idea of being in Christ. So let me define union with Christ or being in Christ to you. See, being in Christ is an expression of intimate interrelatedness. Think of it like the, the air that we breathe, right? The air that we breathe, it is in the person, yet at the same time, The person is in it, right? The Bible is serious about what it means to be in Christ. It's found eight times in the book of Galatians. It's found 34 times in the book of Ephesians. It's found 18 times in the book of Colossians. And this idea of being in Christ is used as an instrumental device. How does God save? How does God forgive? How does God give life? How does God resurrect? How does God move? How, How does God heal? He does so in Christ. It's also used in a a descriptive sense. Where are the sons and daughters of God? They are in Christ. It's also used in Scripture in a centering sense. What is the, the apex of Christian life? It is life in Christ. Like like the air we breathe. We are in it, and it is in us. So a Christian is in Christ. The apex, the the center of our identity, is that I am in Christ and He is in me. And it cannot be taken away from us. You cannot persecute it out of me. The defining reality of my life is that I am in Him and He is in me. My life is not just about listening to the teachings of Jesus and trying to imitate them, but rather it's the resurrection power of Jesus who dwells in me through the Holy Spirit. And I am in Him, and He is in me. This is the rhythm of my life. 
by being in Him and He in me, gives me the courage to carry on. I'm able to live with joy because of it. Regardless of the highs and lows of my life, I am steadfast because I am in Him and He is in me. And when the, the, the transient things of this world fall away, there will only be Jesus. If your hope is in the things that moths and rust might destroy, those things are going to fail you. If your hope is in your home, or if your hope is in your car, or how you're perceived by people, listen, people, people don't think about you nearly as much as you think people think about you. Really. People don't think about you nearly as much as you think they think about you. People don't notice your car as much as you think they might. People don't notice what you're wearing nearly as much as you wish they would. And Jesus is trying to lead us into an understanding of this, of this communion that we have with Him. Not just in communion, but in life. And it's not just about forgiveness, but it's about union, about being in Him, in Him, in us. When we go to communion as we did last week, when we take the bread and we take the cup, we ingest it, we take it into ourselves, something is happening where the Holy Spirit is present with us in that moment as we celebrate. And, and it's not just about our sins of the past, present, and future, but it's about being fully and freely and forever forgiven. And as we celebrate that, as we are taking Christ into ourselves and living out our faith and living out our belief into Him and living out of that power when we walk out of this room, when we do that, as we come together and, and live in that as a body of believers, it's a reminder that the weight of this world doesn't fall on our willpower, but it falls on our willingness to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I mentioned what was going to happen was there's going to be some real frustrations with the authority and lordship of Jesus. And that it was going to kind of slam up against people's personal beliefs and desires and their strongly held beliefs. If you were listening, that's what happens in verses 60 through 71. The people said, this is too hard, right? It's not that they didn't understand. It's that they weren't doing it. It's not like they were saying, we don't understand what it is you're saying here, Jesus. They were angry because they knew what he was saying, and they weren't going to do it. They weren't going to have it. They could tolerate Jesus, the one who fed them, who did something that, you know, pleased them. They could tolerate the Jesus who had healed diseases. They could even tolerate some of his sermons. But we can't tolerate you if you're the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Unfortunately, that's still the case for many people today. This is what our culture is saying. Our culture says things like, your identity is in your sexual orientation. Your identity is in what you own. Your identity is in how much you make. Your identity is in how people perceive you. Your identity is in what tax bracket you're in. Your identity is in what political party you check the box on. Your identity is in this. Your identity is in that. And Jesus is going, no, no, no. If you are a Christ follower, your identity is in me. And all of those other things, all of those other identities must submit to your identity in me. Because that is the path to life. Jesus is trying to lead us into what is good, not into what would harm us. And so oftentimes what we think might make us happy. It won't. The things of this world will fail us. Many of the things of this world, even good things, will wreck us. And they certainly cannot save us. Here's the problem with sin. It overpromises, then it destroys. We think it'll make us happy, whatever it is. But it doesn't last certainly not eternally. And Jesus comes to destroy that system. He comes to replace those selfish impulses that control our lives if we let them and comes to replace those things with Him. You want satisfaction. 
We will seek it in many things. But those things of this world will ultimately never satisfy. Only Jesus can. He is the bread of life. All those other things will rot and decay. The bread of life is offered to all who will come and receive it. What is the work of God? To believe in Him. Everything else springs forth from that. Let's pray.